Hey everyone, you're watching Conversations in Pop Culture, and I am your host, Andrew Davis, and this episode is brought to you by my sponsor, which is my very own t-shirt that is available on Redbubble, making fun of Fallout, Amaro Ray, Taco Bell, Gundam, and the most interesting man in the world. It is available in 16 colors and in a mini skirt, so if you so choose, you could buy it in any which way you want. I don't know if somebody wants to put this on a mini skirt, more power to you. I approve of that message. And I'm not going to bore everybody else with my sponsors here and the rest of them because I have with me legendary voice actor Steve Stanley. So welcome to the show. Hey, yo, what's up? Staley. Staley. But I've been Staley. called Stanley my whole life. Don't worry, it always happens. It's Staley, everybody. Steve it always happens. Staley. I should have asked before. I should have asked before. But no, it, it always happens. I am super excited because you have a bunch of roles, and we're going to be talking about six franchises at the most here um, that you have been part of. And before we really get into all of those franchises, you've been doing this forever. So how did you get into voice acting? Yeah, I, um, in a way, it has been forever, which is weird because as you get older, it doesn't seem like forever, except you look back and you go, this has been forever. Or mostly you see all the the new people coming in and they're young and you're like, well, they weren't here when I started doing this. <laughs> um, well, I, I moved to California from Colorado to um, go to college at uh, Chapman university where I studied theater. I mean, it was my intention to be in California so that after I graduated, I could move up to LA, which is only like 40 miles North of orange County to pursue acting, which I did when I got out of college in 1991. And as you're pursuing your performance activities in LA, you're aware of all the ways that people make money in acting. And while I was auditioning for TV commercials and all that kind of stuff, uh, a roommate of mine said, you wanna take a voiceover class? And I was like, yeah, let's take a voiceover class. I mean, it wasn't surprising or anything because I knew what that was one of the avenues, but I thought, let's do it. And at the same time, I was working at Warner Brothers in an area which at the time was called New Media. So that meant CD-ROM, CD-ROM games, touch screen, things that today we're not even thinking about. Um, but all that media requires voiceover. Everything really requires voiceover. And so I was working um, for them and, and they would occasionally say, we need somebody to say this line on a, on a, on a promo for our, our CD-ROM. So on the CD, it would say, check out our newest release, Dating and Mating. I remember that was one of the things I said. <laughs> so they would have me do these things and I was more than willing to do them. And that put the idea in my head that, wow, look, at I, I can do this here for them. And maybe I could even use some of these elements for... Uh, a demo, which is, which is where my mind mostly was, is getting elements that somebody else paid to have produced to utilize in a demo of mine that I wouldn't have to then pay for, even though that's not how it worked out. But that's what made me think, okay, this is viable. And then Stephanie and I took the voiceover class. And it was during that voiceover class that I was kind of like, oh, this is, this is exactly the stuff I spent my whole childhood and, um, young young adult adolescent life doing all this stuff impersonations and joking and fake interviews on the tape recorder and realized that i was good at this and i thought okay well let's let's add this to the mix of the things that i'm doing and so i had a demo made and shopped it around and and started feeling um a little more of the love than I was feeling in on camera, although I still per pursued on camera in my early 30s. But then at a point, I became just too busy doing voiceovers to have time to do anything else, like running around to the West Side to do commercial auditions because I was booked. I was doing, I was working. And then um, it was very, at very much at the beginning of my career, once I had gotten my demo and I had an agent and I was busy taking workshops that uh, a couple of people 
who I knew, Mona Marshall and um, Bridget Hoffman, were both associated with dubbing, which to you means anime, right? And yes, they brought exactly. me in on some some shows. And right off the bat, Bridget was directing, and I um, got a part uh, on a show, which, oh my God, every time I go to say it, I can never remember it. I think it might be something like Fushuki, Fushuki Yugi or something like that, <laughs> I can't, where I played twins. And they were the leads of the show. And that was my first, that was my first show, actually. And I think it was Fushuki Yugi. God, I can never remember. O often people put it in the chat when I'm bu butchering the names of the show. But but after that, I was uh, set up in the dubbing world, which is only one aspect of voiceover. There are other aspects like TV commercials, radio commercials, ADR in film and television, so movies and, and TV shows. That's a huge part of my work, but that's kind of an anonymous. You're rarely in the credits. Maybe sometimes in a feature film you are, but you're doing voice work in movies and, and TV shows uh, that nobody knows that that's what you're doing, but it's, a, you know, a high paying professional job. And then on, in addition to that, dubbing and anime, which is what you're familiar with. So that's really the background of what, how this all came to pass or what, what it is I'm doing here. And then in the five or six years ago, that transitioned into directing, which in terms of hours, I spend much more of my time directing than I do acting now. And so we're, we're going to talk about that too, because that, that's a whole different ball game as well. Being an anime director and being a voice director, then dubbing, because you got to know everything about, you know, where the show is going over the subset of episodes. But yeah. even to further go into this, because obviously you were in on the early stages of this stuff coming over. So yeah, in a way, I, I think so, because I didn't really, other than maybe some images from things I had seen on TV when I was younger, I did not even know what, what it was. And when I look back, I'm like, oh, yeah, wow, that people were, God, buying VHSs at, at that time. Uh, it was something you had to purchase. So, yeah, I, I was like, at the beginning, yeah, at, at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, because because what was going on is that obviously you had Funimation back in 2000 that was getting every anime thing. I think it was Bang Zoom out in Cali was getting everything, and nobody had any idea what this stuff was per se. Right. Nobody had any idea necessarily even had a dub, and in the industry, I think when you were coming in was just starting to say this is how it's done. Right, like when Maybe I played the part of uh, Master Mage Clef. Um. That was when Bang Zoom was like three people, honestly. <laughs> Owner, engineer, and um, person who ran business affairs. But And now it's a huge company. Yeah. Was, in fact, it was a small company where we'd work at a different studio every time. We would have different locations because I think they were just renting lo locations, studio rooms, let alone now where they've got buildings and, you know, and so mm -hmm. on. And even to talk about, you know, Master Mage class, since you brought it up, that's kind of one of your first major roles that you have. Mm -hmm. Other you know, than the Fushiki Yugi, that was my first role for Bang, for Bang Zoom. And um, and a, a, a major role at that in that show. And, and what was it even like? Because you're coming in and that's a major role. And obviously the scene... And the anime scene was just starting out in yep. that film. And it was kind of like, boom, you're thrown in and you have a significant character that has a significant impact. And were you like, okay, cool, this is a gig and we're going to see where it goes? Or was it like, this is the future moment for you? I think the latter. I was, oh, no, 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 the former. I was putting it in a more day-to-day -day context, it it was more like when and where. This is what we're doing. This is when we need you to be there. And then you get there and there's like, and here's what we need you to do. So it's more about in that actual moment. Here's the line you have to say. Here's the space it has to fit in. And, and doing the work in the moment. So as far as 
your question, I never really thought about it beyond that. I mean, I kept my relationships up because that's what you have to do in business to, to get work. So I, I saw it as the job, the job for that day, because I had a job the next day I had to think about it, and I had auditions I had to do. And so it's more in the moment, delivering honest, full, fully evaluated line readings that match the, the moment. And, and um, the rest is the, the providence of the director because they've got everybody else to worry about. So, so no, I was not thinking about it beyond that in any other way than just let's do what needs to be done here in the moment. And then, and then obviously around the same time, there were some other things that were going on. Heat guy, Jay was around. That's a, he, that's a few years later, but yes, from where we sit now, that was a long time ago. Heat guy came along a few years later and that was a big deal at time because it was gonna be on MTV. And as I've said many times in many interviews, that's that's at least on the top three of my favorite shows that I've ever been in. I just I loved that show. I thought it I thought it looked really cool. I got to admit, I haven't revisited it, so I it, don't it honestly really remember what this is a ridiculous show. It really is, and it's just like so out there for me, and it's just so enjoyable to watch. Though I, I love was that just, show. I was just recently watching it, maybe like three or four months ago. And it's just like, how is this even on MTV? And how does nobody know this show? It's so weird. I agree. I always thought it would have a little more interest in it. Um, but mostly, I remember on that show being struck by the visuals, how cool I thought it looked. And then, you know, Bob Pappenbrook being so fantastic as the robot. And it was a, I loved that show. And then speaking about iconic shows, and this is from my generation, is IGPX, where you were River. I also loved that show. And this this is River, for those who don't remember. It's not the greatest image, but, but it's close enough. And then since we like to talk about blondes on this show, this is Tenji Tenjo right now. And that's another crazy show that's just ridiculous. And I love Oh Great as an artist and as a manga guy, because he's the manga guy. And he just his work is just amazing. And both those shows are just really, really well done and very early in your career. Yeah, I I remember thinking IGPX was fun because at the time it was the first anime that I had been in that was like real like real life, not a uh, whacked out fantasy. If that even makes sense, I guess it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 IGPX felt like it was like, oh, okay, this is going to be the future in, in a lot of ways. And, and, and it was almost like Formula One with Mecha Robots. And it was awesome to that degree. And also, I like the idea that the rivalries actually felt like they meant something. Yeah, it had, it had a lot going on. And I won't lie, it was cool because, you know, H Haley Joel was on that show, Mark Hamill. Like, it was... It was cool at the time in that regard. I remember going in and signing posters one time and I walked in the room and there was a guy already signing and I went in to sign and he looked up and he's like, oh, hey, and I'm like, oh, hey, I'm Steve. I, I'm on the show. And he's like, hey, Steve, Mark Hamill. Nice to meet you. And I remember going back out to my car after that. And I was I almost started crying. I was like, oh, my God, I got to call all my friends. <laughs> So, so, so what is that like? Because one of the things that's happened in voice acting lately is all these celebrities to some degree have come in. And I know Michael B. Jordan is with Rooster Teeth doing Genlock. And then there's other celebrities also on Genlock. And I use Genlock as an example. And then all these people are asking, hey, I want to do voice acting, whether that's big movies or even coming into some roles in that regard and being part of shows and being part of cartoons and anime. And what is that like? Because you never know when somebody's going to get on a show, per se, in this space. And so what is that, that like? started like 20 years ago. And um, for the most part, celebrities doing voiceover exists in a world by itself. Meaning it's not like those projects would exist outside of celebrities doing voiceover. Does that make sense? They're doing yes. projects that were intended for famous people to be part of it as, as the the cell like that's 
that was the intention from the beginning. It's not like they have taken jobs away that I would otherwise book or anybody else. Excuse me. The whole point was to have celebrities do it. So it hasn't, I could look at it like it's affected, but it really hasn't. It's just been a way to make that genre more accessible to people. It's what sells tickets and interest. So uh, it hasn't really made an impact in that regard other than it helps keep animation in the forefront. And it, ha- and it is in the forefront. Yeah, and, and even to go into that as well, because one of the things that happened to me is that I'm 29. So I remember being made fun of in, you know, elementary school and middle school for being an anime weebo, for lack of a better word. And now it's cool to be into anime and it's cool to be into all this stuff that yeah, it's, I've been through my entire childhood. I would say it's it's mainstream. It's not even secondary. You know, before it was secondary, right? When everybody had to buy DVDs and all that. I don't think of it as secondary. I mean, it's a tab. <laughs> it's a tab on all of the streamers. And so what, what is that like for you? Because now you're, and I know you do cons and things of that nature. And what is that like for you though? Because you're getting people from all walks of life coming up to your booth when you sign. And well, the truth and- is I don't, I really don't do cons. Uh, I, I did one a few years ago, had fun at it. But other than that, I haven't done, I haven't done any. And I don't know why. It's not like I have anything against it. I think it's because I'm, I would rather be sitting here on my couch right now on this Saturday than having to fly out yesterday to go somewhere and work this weekend. And so I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to it. And occasionally I get offers for things and I, I accept them for fun. But in the, in the meantime, I, I, <laughs> I don't. So I can't really answer that question because although I know what you're talking about, I don't have people coming up to me because I'm never anywhere where people are are coming up to me. But I suppose that's a good thing because I keep myself uh, uh, mm, what unavailable. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, you're you're in high demand. High demand is the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look at it like that. I'm I'm extremely exclusive. So 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 I I do want to dive into some of the franchise stuff that you've done. And one of the things, obviously, that, that that I am is I'm a huge Gundam fan. And you are, and there's a few people who have the title of Mr. Gundam, for, for lack of a better word here. And you've really done a lot of stuff with Gundam. You were in the OHMS team. I think you were Shiro Amada. I think Shiro Amada. And so this is, this is what Shiro looks like. And, you know, somewhat Top Gun-esque is a good way to put the OHMS team. Um, and so what was this like? Because that's a great and brilliant, brilliant anime. It from is. From it fans. is. Um, I, I, I wasn't aware of Gundam at the time, but I had, but I saw the images and they looked familiar. So I had, they, I'd obviously been exposed to that imagery somewhere. But of course, whenever I did eight, MS8, I don't know, that was like maybe 1998. I, it was a long time ago. And I just remember having fun on that show because it took place at a studio where we all used to work all the time called Magnitude 8 with Les and Mary and Kevin Seymour directing and Joe Remersa. So it was fun. I mostly remember going there and enjoying myself in the moment. Like I said, Magnitude 8 had great snacks. They had a foosball table, pool table, video games. Like it was it was fun going up to Magnitude. And um, and I liked having this leading role. I, I was able to get into it. I felt like I could I understood this character. And that's what began my association with, with Gundam. And in at least from my perspective, me being in, in, taking part in many different Gundams is more coincidence than it is design. But, but who knows? Yeah, and even to go into this, because obviously Gundam, and I don't know how familiar you are with Gundam, but they have made a commitment now, Sunrise, to do the next 100 years from 93 
to 193. And so the UC franchise has just exploded. And so I now I've directed now I've directed Gundams. And, and so what is this like for you? Because clearly OAF MS team, you know, I mean, we don't have to talk about F91. F91 is a rough one, but that's not anybody's fault per se. It's just a, not the greatest Gundam movie out there, but it's enjoyable. Everybody you should go watch it. Um, but the, the idea is that, um, what is that like for you that all this stuff is really relevant though in the Gundam universe? Because that's what makes this even more special, I think, is people are now saying, hey, I want to go watch OAFMS team. And then you're that character. And this is like 20 years old. And it yeah. still stands up and it's still a That's what's cool about animation is it doesn't necessarily come off as dated. It's, it kind of still looks the same. It looks the same. It's still just a story, an anime story that doesn't seem 25 years old. Sometimes it's even better when it's older. It has a, it's, it's uh, aged. <laughs> it has a, a <laughs> and, 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 and then obviously even sticking with Gundam and I made the F91 joke. Um, F91 was supposed to be a big series and then it got condensed into a movie. And that's why F91 is what F91 is. But you were Seabrook in, in F91. And F91, I mean, great concept and brilliant idea. Just just the movie was, was a bit rough, is all I'm going to say. But still a good movie to watch. Enjoyable. What was that like? Because that's continuing the Gundam thing that you were doing and just getting even familiar and further into it. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever seen that top top to bottom uh because if you recall i i might have only had two days of lines on that like four hours maximum <laughs> so in all honesty in my life we're looking at four hours compared to my <laughs> whole life so i don't actually have a lot to say about that it, it, it's all right life. you get a pass on f91 you get a pass <laughs> But 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 I, I definitely want to talk about Unicorn because that's yes. another one. And Unicorn That's more recent. I mean, in a way, more recent. When I close my eyes, I'm like, okay, by more recent you mean two thousand eight or whatever it was. But 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 Unicorn is also very relevant right now as well in the entire Gundam world. And Unicorn, from my understanding, was actually voiced very cool because it was being voiced, I think, in America at the same time it was being voiced in Japan. And so there was no reference to go off of, from my understanding, in Unicorn. And so what was this like? Because this was, I think, the anime that really brought back UC and brought back the Gundam franchise. And people were like, this is the old Gundam that we want. And so what was that like? Because also the, U the release for Unicorn was brilliant, too. It was ex extensive. There was a lot of work on that show. And it was hard. I... Um... I can remember, you know, a, a rough session or two in, in the screaming and the retakes, and it was hard. Um, but then the beauty is once it's over, it's over. And you're like, oh, okay, the result, the result is worth it. So I remember hard, hard work on that show because there were a lot of lines. It was demanding vocally. Uh, it had depth, which wasn't necessarily demanding because I'm an actor. I <laughs> work hard knowing how to do that, but it had emotional depth as well. And so it, it just required all of my skills. And it's, it's just a beautiful anime. It really is in so many ways. And obviously for me as a huge kind of fan, this is like what I wanted back after you know certain things and it's a perfect follow-up to charles counterattack in so many ways as well and what was that even like because because obviously people are like oh i get it and this is a really strong gundam lead and that's something that i think people were lacking to some degree too and people are like oh man i'm associating you with this character well i i didn't get it because at the time it wasn't that right when when it was ta occupying time in my life that part of it didn't exist yet so that didn't happen until much later. And frankly, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm on, I'm on to something else. 
So my association with, um, I almost said IBO, but we're talking about. We're going to uh, talk about IBO too, because I love IBO about also. Still so, uh, I, so the simple answer to your question is uh, in my day to day, I'm more thinking about the time I spent in the booth than what happened with the franchise once it was released. That makes sense. You know, it makes complete sense. And then since you mentioned Ivy Hill, I mean, McGillis is just a brilliant, brilliant character. Very philosophical character as well. I loved that show because on a superficial level, I didn't have to scream. And it was at a point after doing years of anime where I was like, oh, my God, if I have to go there and scream at the top of my lungs, I'm not going to be into it. And so on a superficial level, I loved it because I never had to scream. And I also got to be more of an adult than I had been cast as previous. I, I got to be a, a grown up. And, um, and I, so I loved doing that character because I got to do it the way I wanted. Chris gave me some latitude. He was always saying louder. <laughs> and I would keep trying to play it soft. We were, uh, that's, that's what mostly it was like in our sessions. And um, in some ways, I felt like I got to do what I wanted. And ultimately, I loved that character. It was, it was fun doing that. And, and even to talk about this, because I think this is something that is actually sort of not known when people watch anime, is that you can really strain and mess up your voice. You know, if any, everybody has screaming. They have, oh, my God, my throat is so sore. But if you have a character that is constantly screaming, you know, you're going to blow out your vocal cords or damage your vocal cords. And you're not yeah, going to be able to I try to be in directing because coming from acting, I'm try to. I'm very sensitive about that screaming. Like I'm always right before a scream. I'm like, okay, let's watch that again so that you can really plan out what you're going to do. I never had anybody say that to me, but then you waste take one because you're not really tuned into the timing. I hate having to say we need to do that again it was 10 frames short so i say let's look at that again when you really think about what you're going to do because i don't want to waste screaming the, 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 there's a saying in wrestling that you have a bump card and a bump is a really hard fall that and you might only get 10 or 15 of them and then your career is over and i'm not saying if you're screaming you have to scream again but if you go through enough of those and, and, and feel free to correct me if i'm wrong there's going to get a point where if you're screaming every day in anime, you're going to destroy your voice faster well, than you It, it depends, you but it's not. It's not good. Good. <laughs> but it's also your job, and so there's a, it's a lot of things to be taken care of. That's why I do my part as a director to not blow out people on screaming. And then, then even if, the, if I'm looking to correct nuance. And then obviously, and then even talk about shifting over to directing in Gundam, because that, that's a whole different ballgame also. And what is that like to really be able to direct in different animes and also put the directing hat on? Because, and, and, and I think most directors and voice directors have done voice acting, but I think there's some that haven't. There's to just naturally. And so what is that like for you knowing well, I'm sure familiar with it. I can't, this is gonna, I, I wish I wasn't even saying this out loud, but what's the name of the, I directed Gundam Rise, what, what was it called? Gun, Rustin Quiska or something? Gundam Rise, this is just me spacing because I'm thinking of Gundam, but uh, yeah, I directed tons of episodes of of the Gundam, which was a little more uh, f for kids, but it was sure fun. You, you mean build, build Gundam build fighters? Build divers, goodness gracious, yes. Great show, great show. It's, 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 it's not for children, it's not for kids, okay? Really? It, it, it has so much nostalgia in it that it is brilliant. It is, it is the greatest Gundam series ever created. Because I love it. they have all these references to Gunpla. And they throw things from Gundam Wing in there. They throw things in from UC, and it's oh, it's it's epic. It is not for children. Is all I'm gonna yeah. say. I mean, I like that show because it's just seemed irregular to me. Like like you know, it pl plausible. I guess is a better way to put it. Right there, 
they're in regular Earth, like we know Earth, and then they go into this other world through essentially VR. So it does, it makes a type of sense. It's not full on fantasy. The fantasy part takes place in a plausible fantasy scenario of VR, even though the world really exists. I get all that. But um, so that made it fun because we got to direct the parts where they're just working in the store, put, clipping together their gumpla. But then we go to the world where it's all really happening. It just had a lot, I had a lot going on. Oh, it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant show. And, and, and also, you know, it, it's not as intense as like a war is going on because right. nobody dies per se in that show. <laughs> right. It's just about them t having adventures. It's, it, it, it's a great show. But, but, but we do need to talk about wars and fighting and deaths. And, and we do need to talk about Neji because <laughs> Neji is epic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, 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 how did this come about? Because Neji has such a wonderful evolution arc as a character. I, it's true. And what's funny is, you know, we've now had the original Gundam wave when we did it. And now it's, it's, a, it's got a little bit of a resurgence, which in my opinion is because the people who watched it when they were younger are now older and they're still into it. Um, but, but yeah, he, Talk, talk about an evolution. It's really funny how many people now who are grown up all say to me, I hated Neji. <laughs> I hated Neji, which is like, oh, good. I like that. So I don't care, right? It's I don't care what their feelings were. It means that the character, I, you were supposed to not like him. Yeah. And, and, I did my even, job right. To, to even talk about this, because... Neji obviously is an asshole at the start of Naruto. To put it to put it nicely, okay? Yeah, I, I'm oh like, my god, it was great because there's Miley, and I'm going in, and if she's already recorded doing the nut job, Naruto, right? Because he's a nut job. So it was fun to get to be the one who was like, "I hate you, you suck, this is bullshit," right? It was fun to go in and be the the anti. Well, I'm not really an anti hero, but the the antagonist essentially it's so brilliant and then and then obviously naruto beats neji up and neji has a change of heart and then we get to the yeah like five match. years nine years into it. it but but even even into to, to when they go after sasuke you have the change of heart and what is brilliant about that arc is every single character choji shikumaru um kiba and a few others, they all have an opportunity to showcase what they can do. And you have this whole thing where Neji now becomes a team player during the hunt down for Sasuke and almost- Right, Sasuke practically... in the darkness. That was a big thing, Sasuke in the darkness. Man, I felt like we did Sasuke in the darkness for a whole year. And, and it, was, it was brilliant though, because you have this thing and Neji's legitimately on the brink of death with the fight with the spider guy. And what was that like? Yeah, that was yes, that was moment. fun. It was just such a brilliant moment. And it was like, it, Neji was the star in Naruto in that moment. Yeah, I remember those. That 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 was always like, what's going to happen next? Because, <laughs> right, I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm sitting there at the stories being revealed to me as I'm acting it out. Because we don't get that shit in advance. You know that. Yes, yes, exactly. You get like pretty much you come into the booth and, and there's the pages. Off. And may, maybe you have an idea of saying, look, Neji's not going to die today is maybe what you get. But even still, you don't know if your character is going to die that day. No, or you don't. Time. Nobody does. As an actor and a director, you go to your job and you're like, I mean, you don't know if. I have been on a job, although I cannot tell you the character because I don't remember, but you're, you've done it for months. You come in one day and you're like, oh, I just died. This is the end of my job. Wow. Okay. And sometimes as the director, I'm like, okay, and you just died. But it was great having you on this show, you know. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if, if you know you have 26 episodes in the series ending and a character dies in episode 25, it's not as bad as if somebody right. walks in and it's issues. You don't expect your kill. character to die and there you are in a death scene. As an actor, what you're thinking is, oh my God, 
this job is over. And then, and then, and then, obviously, go, going even forward because Neji does die. Spoiler alert! Sorry if you haven't seen, you know, Naruto. which is in a way is an example. Neji died clear up at the end, essentially. Right? I mean, the show was almost over by the time I died. And, and but, but he died in such a great way, though. He was like protecting Naruto, and he was fighting for Naruto. Oh, it was epic, and it was just so impactful. And what yeah, was that I, like, too? And also, Neji is mentioned in other Naruto things. And Neji is obviously paid Oh, my God, it's anime. So after that many years when I died, even then I was like, I'm still in this. Like, I still kept going to work as much after I died as I, before because there were flashbacks, there were spinoffs, video games. But the doing the death. That was fun. It was taxing as motherfucker, though. It, it was hard. But at the same time, I was able to take it seriously because after that many years, I appreciated more what it was about. And um, I think I'm confusing two shows, but I feel like Jamie directed the death, Neji's death. I don't know what that that doesn't necessarily mean anything outside of our world but i know i know i know jamie simone yeah simone uh, in which I, jamie plays what akamaru or does he play kiva not that i know of no he's the owner of the studio and i i think he plays kiva's dog and he, boy he he might he, he might just for fun uh yeah but yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but but i know the name that's why ever right he's a he's a big name i think he i think he might have directed my death and i you know it was always a big deal when jamie would be directing just because he was the owner of the studio and he's the one everyone looked up to and uh but I, but uh neji's death was fun because it was like delicious you know what i mean i gotta really go for it and then, and then and then obviously with naruto and one of one of the cool things about naruto and even a bit of boruto is that obviously there's flashbacks, there's always references, there's always voices that need to be done. And Naruto- yeah, I've only been on Boruto maybe once or twice as Neji, but I have been on it. It's the gift that keeps giving. And then really where I think the Naruto gift is, is in two things, where there's Rock Lee and Friends, and that's been off. <laughs> and that's just, that's just fun. To oh my watch. God. Talk about like candy. That was, that was so- fun ryan directed that it i don't want to say we didn't take it seriously but it it was a you could go have fun doing it because i was always getting to be neji at his most irascible it, it was a uh, you know it was a joke jokey show it was just fun to go do those sessions because i i didn't feel i had to be particularly serious and then you know, to make it good because because it was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to be a break from the norm, but still be Naruto-esque, for lack of a better word. Yeah, and be fun. Uh, it was also on that show. Remember, this is years ago, and no one is going to believe this when I say it. It wasn't until that show that I realized that Danielle Judovitz played, um, what's her name? Ten Ten? Yes, uh, because I know Danielle from looping from TV shows and movies. So we'd known each other for years, but dubbing never came up between us really. And so we were on rock Lee and I find out that it's Danielle. And I was like, you mean we've been doing this for like 12 years and I did not know that it was Danielle. I couldn't believe it. Cause like I said, I know her. We, <laughs> it, it, it just, we never talked about it because you know, in dubbing you're going in one at a time our paths never crossed. I didn't recognize her voice because she's doing a character. And it was a it was just a big light bulb moment, sun coming out. Where I was like, oh my God, it's me and Danny. I had no idea. That's kind of funny. That, 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 it that's is funny, funny that I wouldn't know that. Even at the moment, I was like, I thought, I remember being in the studio that day over on um what we would call the annex no not the annex but the you know ventura and um sitting there thinking how did i not know this all these years 
but because it was Rock Lee, it was more obvious because it was the three of us, right? So Ryan told me that. I was just like, how, how did I not know that? How stupid. But it's funny now. <laughs> That's kind of... <laughs> I can't help but laugh because 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 it, it seems so simple and so it's the simple things that that, that are the funniest. Right. Um, but why would I know that? And honestly, I didn't recognize her voice because I'm talking to a woman who I know. But when she's she's not really doing a voice, but it's not her speaking voice, so it didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. That that that's brilliant. And then then the other thing that Naruto kept giving was the video games, and they're still giving the video games to some degree. And I think people some degree, can... there hasn't been one in a while, but they, yes, the answer to that, yes. And, and so, what is that like? Because that's something that I think people also don't understand is that. And I'm going to say something that that may not be 100 sure, but the idea is that voice acting it's a job, and voice acting to pay your bills. There's a lot of things that you can do in voice acting, and video games help to do that having a lot of gigs and things like that. And so this is just helpful. And when you get a video game gig, it is helpful. Well, because they it pays more money. Uh, Th that and there's also more work. It, it, it just Depends. anytime you get more work, it's always good. And then whatever. Video games are hard because the demand on you is a little bit greater, right? That's a lot of efforts and hits. The work goes by fast. Like if it's to time, they'll play you a Japanese reference and you have to do Take A, take B. We wait, they select, you move on. Next line, take A, take B. Like it's intense. It is unrelenting. There's no sitting around, acting out a scene. It is all line reading, line reading, line reading. This is intense. This is intense. This is whispered. This is yelling. One, two, three, four. For four hours. It's it's tough. And also, isn't it the fact that sometimes you have to say the line six times and you have to say it differently because you have low health, you have super health, you're super maxed out. You use like a potion that changes your demeanor and all to of a sudden some, to some degree you're right yeah mostly for effort sounds that it's a low medium and high in order to create a library of low medium and high but you can sometimes have a list a page long of death one low medium high death two low medium high taking damage low medium high receive uh giving damage one two three jumping one two three it's a lot yeah, it's it, it's from from I've been speaking to voice actors for over ten years, and it is intense, and it is not a job I want to do because I like my voice the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'd always be like, "Oh, there goes my singing voice." Hey, I see that Malik has a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's it's it's, it's Malik's question right here. What a few voice, few mistakes actors who aren't used to dubbing make. Not watching the mouth. On the preview. I guess that answers the week's question right there. <laughs> um, but but e even going forward into Bleach, and then we're going to end with, with like two more after that. But obviously, Toshiro, and I, I'm not going to get the name, the other part of that name. Toshiro right. Hitsugai. I, I wasn't going to get it right Hizagi. either. I mean, pretty much, we went from ninjas to samurai. Right. right. That's what we've just done. Um, for those who need a reference, this is how he looks. Oh, um, he man, he, he's the ice guy in Bleach. Yeah, Guy Goran Hyorun Maru. He, he, he's, a, he's a fun character. He's the exact opposite in Neji in so many ways. <laughs> he's dark, though. Um, and he got a, a little more... He didn't have any inter the same internal conflict that Neji had. He was just... I don't know. I think the, of the captain as kind of a badass in his way. Oh, I love his character. Don't get me wrong. I think his character is fun. And then when yeah. he's like fighting, I mean, he's just like, I'm going to kill you. And that's the end of the discussion. It's, it, there's no like discussion. And he's not like he's a no nonsense captain, but he's also at least rational and he can think. You know, he, he's skeptical. Like during the entire Izine arc, he was skeptical of what was going on. Yeah. And um, still got some lighthearted moments. That was the whole sub plot between him and Rangiku, which I got to be light. You know, those, the humorous moments between them and the others, it, it, it had a lot. I, 
I don't want to say Bleach and Naruto overlap, but they kind of overlap in my mind. Like I keep talking about the day to day because they both took place at Studiopolis. Well, they both took place at Studiopolis. <laughs> like I had to drive to the same place. There's also a lot of the same cast crosses over, you know. Yeah. Derek Stephen Prince was on Bleach. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of people from Naruto are on Bleach because you're in California and it's all relatively close. And so you, the same people who work and obviously the same directors. Right, it's the same to, studio. Yeah. The pool is, is similar. And so that that's kind of what, what Bleach was in a lot of ways, was was very similar. But it's also a whole different show. I mean, totally different. And, and also the things that it was shown in Jump. And so it, it had the same, I guess, manga distribution company, which also helped. And it was also considered to be part of the big three, which is One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach. And so it was in those. And also a lot of this stuff was airing at the same time. I think Bleach was on before Naruto or Naruto was on before Bleach on Toonami back in the day. So naturally, all of a sudden, and even like on Anime Mondays or Anime Mondays, Bleach and Naruto were on like, within like an hour of each other. So yeah. A lot of similarities, at, at least as far as how it was being consumed. But I think so like, too, yeah. But like Bleach, I mean, not, not like Bleach, but like Naruto, Bleach is also a gift that just kept giving because it had a lot of movies. It had some video games. A lot of and movies. Obviously. And video that's games, cool. not as many as Naruto, but video games. And that's why they overlap because they both were just consistent jobs and they both had video games associated and and so on. Bleach, I got to play two completely different parts, which was cool. I loved that. Mm -hmm. that, doesn't, that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, and, and it's just fun. And also, you have like a memorable character. Everybody knows the Ice Captain. They might not know his name, but they know the Ice Captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they can't say his name, but that's... The, yeah. <laughs> since when is that not the case in anime? Yeah. Oh, that's one of the cool things about your career in a lot of ways. And look, you, you have a bunch of role, roles that, that people don't remember, but you have a bunch of them that they, they do. Neji, obviously, you know, the ice captain whose name I just can't say I'm going to fail and I would rather not embarrass myself today any further. Um, <laughs> but what, what is that like? Because when you do get those roles and people know Neji, I mean, I was joking with a bunch of people on Twitter and people were saying, you can't have him on. He's dead. And I just thought it was a very funny joke on Twitter that my friend made. But everybody knows who Neji is. Everybody knows who the Ice Captain is. Everybody yeah. knows a variety of other characters that you've known. Yeah. People like Kitsugaya. And then everyone's always telling me, I hated Neji. I know I said that already, but that's what that's what's so cool about that. And then, 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 then the, the, the final voice role, maybe, that they're going to talk about it as far as, I guess, traditional anime and from across the, the sea on the West Coast is Sailor Moon. And I think he did Rebius. And, and I probably got the name wrong, but what um, was cool? Uh, Crimson Rubius. Rubius, Crimson and Rubius. Susie directed that. And one time, this was just after, I don't know, one day of work, I came in and, and I was like, wait, now what line are we at? Aren't I playing uh, Crispin Rubens? And so every session after that, we would joke about my character, Crispin Rubens, because it was, well, now I can't remember the name I just said, but Rubius is what we would call him, but a oh, Crimson Rubius. And I was like, Crispin Rubens. So we had a great joke for all of that time about Crispin Rubens. And it was fun to be part of, of Sailor Moon, especially getting to play a juicy character like that, even though the truth is he wasn't in it a ton, but he was juicy. And that's the, that's the part that's fun yeah and, and even going further into this because i think that viz redubbed the regular first sailor moon and then they also did crystal at the same time or right after and what was that like getting to do both of those things because people it gave people a choice on what they wanted to watch and it kept it consistent which i think is nice too that honestly i know what you're talking about but I have no personal recollection of that being a thing for me. I remember that going to work. I remember being told that, but I don't, that didn't impact me personally or in terms of the work. So I don't have a real response to that. 
but I know what you're talking about. Oh, I, I just like when, when, when companies keep consistency. It's kind of like when a company keeps the same character in the video game to me, and then it's in the anime. It just solidifies the point. And I think it's the right move versus the wrong move because it would be really weird if I'm playing a video game in Bleach or Naruto and you're not Neji. You know what I mean? And for me, it just, uh, and I know that, that you answered, but that's just my personal preference. Anytime a company can keep consistency, it's always better for the fan. Yeah. I get, a, I get a lot of stuff, even though I don't know anything about this, so we don't need to talk about it, about the, the new Bleach and everyone asking, will you guys be in it? The truth is, I don't know. You don't ever know anything as an actor until the, the phone rings, but consistency, it, it will be interesting to see how that happens. And I'll be I don't even know anything about, about the new Bleach. I know nothing about what's going on with Bleach. I don't know anything about the new Bleach. So Please. you're lost with me. It's I don't need to say. think about it. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. I just know from what people ask me. And then, and then, then I do want to back out of anime, and I do want to talk a little bit about Marvel because you did some X Men anime stuff that I'm not exactly sure the whole story behind this. It's not my area of expertise. What was the name was, of that show? I think it was like X Men, like anime. I know you were like Takito Sasaki or something. And, yeah, and, and I was. The, I played the older brother. I just can't remember the full title of that show. I, I don't remember it either, but but I know that there was also Marvel Discord, the Avengers, which also had sort of an anime vibe to it. And I just think it's a really cool role. And I like the fact that- It Marvel was. I love that I wasn't one of the superheroes, that I was just a little brother because I got to be in every every episode. That was fun. Uh, uh, Jamie directed that for the most part as well because it was a big deal. I don't remember anything really about it ever publicly, but I remember doing it and having fun because it was all of the characters all in the same place and it was, um, uh, you know, recognizable uh, Marvel stuff. The idea that I can't remember the title is embarrassing. Uh, but I don't remember like the title either, so you're with me and then we're both embarrassed then. <laughs> I can't remember. A lot of media has come and gone in that same genre. Uh, of course, the second I saw it, I'd be like, that's what it is. I just did. I don't have it at the top of my mind. But that I like being that the the innocent older brother working with all the superheroes. That was a cute show. I like that show. I just like the, the name. Fact, that yeah, I just like the fact that it was definitely more anime vibe. And I like the fact that it was Marvel and that it was just sort of a fun thing. And I'm like, cool, this is kind of fun. And, and Nice. We're, we're, we're finally getting, you know, the hybrid of American comics meets, you know, Eastern animation style. And then and, and it's just fun. Um, but yeah, that, 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 those are the major roles I want to talk about. You've done everything practically. I know that you worked on Digimon 2 for a while as well. And that, that's an amazing yeah, show. Koji. Yes, yes. I do have a picture of Koji. Yeah, the little headband. Yep, there he is. That was a great character. His little bad attitude. He got to be emotional. That that was a great character. And and everybody who's worked on Digimon's worked on Naruto has worked on Bleach. It's like it's like a rite of passage. Has worked for Saban. Like legitly, like there's all these people who have gone through this system. Right, because in that generation, no, it wasn't. There weren't more people who did it. Like <laughs> there, it just wasn't as huge. It was just our pool. And, and it's just super fascinating. And it's so weird because like all these people have run through the same circles. And, you know, obviously I do want to back out of the roles, but even to dive into this, I mean, a lot has changed in the entire anime dubbing world uh, in, in a lot of ways. You know, COVID has had an effect where things are recorded from home. Also, uh, people yeah, yeah, like Malik has another question re regarding that. But yeah, dubbing from home, I direct from home exclusively. Um, sometimes actors go into the studio, sometimes they don't. It's a, it's a hybrid and it, ha it will always be because we started doing in voiceovers, we started doing, um, auditions and stuff from home, like 15 or 16 years ago, working from home is nothing new in, in voiceover. It took a minute to figure out how to do dubbing from home. That's a whole other thing, but as far as actors having microphones and stuff at home to do your stuff, that is not new. Having to outfit your closet and make it essentially broadcast quality is new, but not having to record from home for sure. You used to go into auditions 
uh, in person at your agent's office. And then it just hybrid into, okay, I'll do this from home or, okay, I'll come in for a group read. Uh, so the at home thing is just, is pretty standard. So studios are still into protocols, right? One person at a time, but studio situation is not something I would ever be weird, weird about with COVID because there's nobody else there. You're in a room by yourself. Yeah. I think that that's something that people forget that voice acting, it's very much like comic book writing where it's a very lonely process and, and it's you and maybe two, three other people around at most. You yeah. Know? And you're in a director and, um, like I said, I didn't even know Danielle was on this show because you never see the other people. You go in at your time. And a, a part of a COVID protocol, it used to be you would leave and the people would be waiting. You'd see who's waiting to come in next. But now it's spread out, so you wouldn't even see who's there waiting. Half the actors on the shows I direct at this point, I've never met in person. It, 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 and, and I think it's only going to get further that now with everything that's going on. And, you know, obviously I know that other voice actors said, you know, you'd pet somebody in the hall. Like, oh, hi, my name is so-and-so. And then you'd be like, oh, you're working on this show too. And then you might have a friend that you develop a relationship with and you might throw them a joke, you know, think to try to make them laugh when they come to the studio next, you know, <laughs> it's because I know oh, people. Oh, yeah. That. Well, that can still happen. <laughs> <laughs> we still do that occasionally because we know based on the schedule who's coming in next and we'll throw in a joke and drop it on the talent and see what see what happens just for our own amusement i i i know enough stories and i do not want to tell any of them on this very show because i don't know oh yeah it's never it's never safe for public consumption it's always something nasty we do oh, we, i recall that uh maybe it was demon slayer i don't know with, with bryce we would we would drop a lot of takes in just to then hit zach with see if he would notice you know what I'm saying. he would say the wrong line and it was nasty and then then and then in zach's record we would play that take and it would basically be me and the engineer waiting to laugh about it because no one else is there so it's a pretty esoteric joke but mm, we got a laugh out of it there's so many it. things i know about that i cannot talk about ever publicly and all I know is that legitimately Jeff Nimoy made me laugh for 30 minutes straight about Kachume from Zatch Bell. That's, and it wasn't even Zach nasty. Bell, yeah, I think I was on that show. And um, yeah, Jeff definitely with the joking. Just, just, just <laughs> terrible. Just, 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 just absolutely terrible. And it wasn't even nasty. It was just absolutely ridiculous what he was saying yeah and ridiculous I'm just imagining Kachime speaking about it and like with the duck beak oh brilliant just yeah oh, plenty, man. plenty i will only take time for joking if it's really funny as a director i cannot abide wasting time even i, I just i can't i'm all about work so if the joke is funny enough, we'll do it. But mostly I'm like, nope, next take, next line. We're not here to play. We're here to work. <laughs> you, 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 you know what it is? I, I say it before, you know, Mussolini was, was a terrible, terrible leader, but he did keep the trains running on top. <laughs> That's the classic. So That's the classic statement. Yeah, I, I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, all right, next line, next line. But if a joke's funny enough, that makes it even funny for because then it comes as a surprise. Yes, there, there's a lot of stuff. And every once in a while, something gets into like a dub and into the back end of things by somebody and it's brilliant. But obviously there's a lot of other stuff going on. Um, and, and I am curious where you see the entire voice acting world going because obviously anime is only getting bigger. And, and, and the role for, for voice shows um, the roles for, for cartoons are only getting bigger. I mean, I think the source material for all this stuff has gone up by 10 to 20 fold in oh, quality. Yeah. And that means there's better shows coming, better technology. And also, I think there's better talent coming down the road where I just think there's a generation that is going to be more talented than the next generation. And maybe I'm optimistic about it. That doesn't mean that I think that in the next 20 to 30 years, 
the voice actors that are now coming up are going to be far better than the generation before they came up. Well, it's just a wider field. There's just more projects and more people. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I just think that, that, that there's also just more and more training and a variety of other things, but you don't have to hash that. That's out. probably true in a way that there wasn't before. We all, I had to learn at work. I didn't know how to, well, you had to learn how to put a real performance on, onto somebody else's flaps. That that's hard, but I had to learn to do that at work. There was no class you could take. Luckily, all my skills that I was already good at were able to transfer, but I had to learn on the job. Yeah, and, and, and I think I think that at this point also, you know, I think that there's also just people are being taught how to do that. And I also think technology has eliminated some of those things that need to be done. Yeah, I, I can't really remember, but I sure know that when I started, the beta SP had to be put into a recorder in the machine room. And when we would go to do another, uh, other takes, you would have to wait for the master to rewind to the start of your dub or to change reels, to go to another reel for a uh, more work. And now once digital came in, you hit one button and it goes back to the beginning of the take. I, I can't even really remember what it was like with the beta SP other than watching it rewind to do the, to do another take. And then, and then, then I don't even know if this is the three beep system or even before yeah, the it was still, that's ADR is the same as it ever was, but the technology that makes it happen is digital instead of analog. And so that, that helped it to be more efficient because there's no rewinding. And yeah, there's no machine room, but you have to all your resources are in a computer and that causes its own problems. But yeah, like when the Internet goes down mm -hmm. or <laughs> crashing or Pro Tools or studio mysteries, right? Bugs. Yeah, so it's all really, it all works out to be the same one way or the other. It's half a dozen of one or half a dozen of the other. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, and, and this is all massively technical, and I am not qualified to answer any technical question on directing. I am not a voice actor. I am not a director. You are a voice actor and a director. But again, there's also a bunch of people who teach this, and you can take a bunch of people's classes, whether virtually, online, whatnot. Um, and obviously, if, I'm just going to say this, and feel free to correct me again. Um, if you want to actually learn this skill, you need to a do a lot of research before you take anybody's class and more importantly once you do your research you then need to say hey do i really want to go down this path and you actually need to make a fair determination uh, on those positions and say what does this career actually look like and how am i going to support myself because th those are great questions and so obviously you know that's something that you got to keep in the back of your head if you really are watching this and seeing this I recommend doing a lot of research and a lot of thinking before you embark on this journey. Not saying you shouldn't do it because I think you're doing great with it. I love Neji. I love Sword Guy. I love your Gundam work. And yeah. if you do what you love, you're not working, but you also need to be an adult, I feel. And that's something that I think people need to hear sometimes. Um, there, there are a lot of great books, books to read that give a introduction to what this is all about. And then, um, you know, people who want to pursue their dreams, whatever that means. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, that, that you should go for things, but I just think you should be informed. But on that note, we've been talking for a little over an hour and I do want to give you a chance to self promote yourself because that's why we're here. This is a gigantic shell of everything that you've done in your life. So, uh, where can people find you, support you, hit you up on social media, bother you, not bother you? Yeah, you can you. bother me on Instagram. I don't post a lot on Instagram. I am on Twitter, but I find that Twitter is my political space where I vent. Uh, so if you're not interested in that, I, I, yeah, I, I'll go back and forth with anime things on, on Twitter because there's a lot of people follow me there, but it's, it's my venting space. But um, Instagram and then uh, – 
this is uh i have something in the works with uh, blackjack anime in miami for an, an appearance for signing at, a, at an opening of the not an opening but at, at their store that's just all in the works as of even even today so that's something that'll probably happen at end of august and september if you're in miami um and other than that, man, keep watching. Watch Demon Slayer. Watch uh, Rising of the Shield Hero. All those great, shows. Great show. Irregular great Magical show. High School. Great show, Rise of the Shield Hero. Great show. But and Demon Slayer and, is a, and a bittersweet show at this point because, of course, as you well know, we lost Billy yeah. last week in this show, season two, the show that he was the, a star of. And so that's been intense working on, on that show. Um for that reason, uh, but Stephen Fu stepping into the breach uh, honorably in uh, honor, you know, of Billy's life and his great work. It's it, it's a tough pill to swallow, to, to say the least. It, th- there aren't there aren't words even right now. It's too it's too this is up too. Real life is hard. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big loss. It really is, and and, and it's upsetting to, to to say the least. But you know, I don't want to speak beyond that. And obviously, everybody's got to you know more in their way. And much respect to Billy's family and for sure his work. Um, for sure. But, but nevertheless, I, Rising of the Shield Hero is part of his legacy and the transition that has occurred. And so, more power to it. And everybody should go rewatch the first season and the second season. In honor of him. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It, it will be time well spent. I promise you that. Um, and on that note, I think that is a perfect ending to the show. Um, I'm going to give you the final word, though, before we all peace out. All right on. Well, thank you, Andrew, for having me. Uh, again, a delightful apology for me gardening through our life. It, it, it's video. all right. It's not and, a big deal. Uh, uh, don't hold I, wish, I wish you could have had a video when I was out there clipping my flowers going, oh, my God. I was going to clip flowers until it was time to do the interview, which I have just worked all the way through. But hey, uh, it gave us a good story. And thank you. And thanks, everybody else, for watching and staying interested. Keep it up. Tune in. And thank you so much. Well, that is a perfect way how to end this show, everybody. And we will catch you in the next one.